In Matthew 1, 5, we read that Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Does that mean that Rahab was the mother of Boaz? And how do genealogies work in the Old and New Testament anyway? Stay tuned and we'll find out. This is the Bible Sojourner, where we discuss issues related to the Bible, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Peter Gaiman, professor of Old Testament and Biblical Languages at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Shalom and welcome. Let's get started. Well, here we are with another episode of the Bible Sojourner. And today we're going to talk about the genealogy of Jesus Christ, specifically the relationship between Boaz and Ruth and Rahab, how all that goes together. Now, this question comes up every time I teach through my Old Testament survey class. We go through the book of Ruth and the question comes up, well, what is the relationship between Boaz and Rahab? Because they are actually linked in Matthew's genealogy. Now, for example, I'm going to read Matthew 1 here. It says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then he goes and lists the different generations. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. So you have there in the first verses, the first five and into the verse six there of Matthew 1, the genealogy, the first part of genealogy, tracing Jesus's ancestry from, you you have Abraham listed there because Matthew is very Jewish in its flavor, there, there's an attempt to, to make sure we understand Jesus is related both to Abraham as well as David primarily. Those are the two key figures in Matthew. And so you have Jesus being traced to Abraham here as a primary component of this genealogy. And the question comes up, well, are there gaps in these genealogies? Or can we take this at face value and say, well, obviously, Boaz has to be the daughter of Rahab. Now, there are many people who would say that Boaz is the daughter of Rahab, but I think it's a little more complex, and we're going to have to dive in and talk about exactly what is going on in these genealogies and what some of the genealogies speak to with regard to sequence. Now, before we do that, though, I do want to make a mention of genealogies generally, because it may be surprising. For those of you who are reading the book of Matthew or Luke 3 with regard to genealogies, and I I know exactly what this is like growing up. I remember thinking to myself, let's please not read the genealogy for Christmas. I do not want to read the genealogy. That's so boring. There is no benefit to that. And that's our typical Western mindset. We tend to view genealogies as very boring and non-consequential. But that's so far from the ancient Jewish mindset of family identity and one's belonging. Who you are presently in the Jewish mindset does relate to who came before you and your family. And to a large degree, this is even evidenced by the prominence of genealogies throughout the Old Testament, even into the New Testament. Some of the most prominent examples would be Genesis. In Genesis, we did a podcast a long time ago, and I'm sure hardly anybody has listened to it, uh, on the Toledot structure of Genesis. And the Toledot structure of Genesis is really remarkable because the entire book of Genesis is essentially built around the genealogies and tracing the messianic seed, which is promised in Genesis 3.15 about how there's going to come the seed of the woman he's going to strike a death blow to the head of the serpent. And so throughout Genesis, then you have the tracing of this genealogy in what becomes known in scholarly circles as the Toledot formula. Toledot is just the Hebrew word for generations. So each time you read that phrase in the English Bible, these are the generations of etc. You have you have a heralding of this genealogical idea in Scripture. 
So you can actually trace the genealogy of Scripture through Genesis, where you're, you're tracing this messianic line. It then picks up in the book of Ruth. And the end of the book of Ruth, the last section in Ruth 4, I think it's 18 to 22, if I remember correctly, you have the verses that deal with, okay, how does Boaz and how does Ruth fit into the genealogy? And you even have the Toledot formula used there. And you have the tracing then from Perez, who links with the tribe of Judah, who according to Genesis 49 is going to be the royal line through whom the scepter shall not depart. So Judah, the scepter shall not depart from him and he will rule. So somebody from Judah is going to rule. We find out in Ruth that it's going to come through the family of Jesse through the person of David. And so Ruth ends on a genealogy, which to us, we're used to ending with the most exciting part of the whole book, right? That's whenever you're reading any kind of book, you want it to end on a climax. You don't want to end by saying, oh, I really don't want to finish this book. So boring. But that's what Ruth does is it finishes on a genealogy because that is viewed as the climax is think about how exciting this is, is that, you know, then through which family the Messiah is going to come. And that's really the, the grandest culmination of the book of Ruth. And then you say, OK, well, now what? Well, then we get to the New Testament era. And guess what? The first book out of the gate when we're when we're looking at the Gospels, we have the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. That's verse one of Matthew one. And this is zeroing in on that same phrase. By the way, that same phrase, the book of the genealogy there is Greek. That's the Greek translation of the Toledo formula. So Matthew one is linking with the other genealogies in the Old Testament through Genesis and Ruth to trace the messianic line. So this would not be lost on the readers of Matthew or the listeners, the hearers, as the book is being read to them. They would be saying, oh, I know that phrase. I know I know this plan. This genealogy traces with the other genealogies that we read about. And so we have this important genealogy, which is tracing the messianic line, giving us authentication for who this person Jesus is and whether or not he deserves to be the Messiah. So all of that is background to the this question then is what is the relationship between Rahab and Boaz? Because here you have very clearly the linking of Salmon, who is the father of Boaz, by Rahab. And so how is this to be understood? Now, there's something that we need to understand very clearly out of the gate here, and that's that we can date with certainty when Rahab lived, but we are a bit mixed and, and it's difficult to date with certainty when Boaz lived. OK, so Rahab lives 100 percent. We we have her in the chronology of Joshua as to when she lives. And she is is there when Joshua and the people of Israel take the city of Jericho. And so she can be dated very firmly to 1406 B.C. OK, 1406 B.C. You might say, well, how do we get that date? Well, there's there's a way that you can calculate when the date of the Exodus occurs. And that comes from first Kings six, one. So in first Kings six, one, you have Solomon building the temple for Israel. So, so we can date Solomon's reign very effectively because of all the dates and chronologies that are given in the book of, of Kings. We can date the beginning of Solomon's reign to about 970 BC. Okay. So 970 BC is when Solomon starts to reign. And then in first Kings six, one, we read that it was in the 480th year, 480th year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel. So you put those two dates together. What is the fourth year of Solomon's reign? If he begins reigning around 970, four years later, remember you're subtracting because it's BC, not AD. So four years after 970 is 966. So 966 is when Solomon is building the temple. And it also tells us that it's the 480th year after Israel came out of Egypt. So it's really simple math. You just take 966 plus 480 and you get to 1446 BC as the date of the Exodus. Very simple math. Uh, there, there are some complicating issues for why people argue that 1446 isn't the date of the Exodus. That's going to have to be another episode. 
but I think very firmly we can date the Exodus at 1446 BC. That's just straightforward what scripture says. Now, in so doing then, the 40 after the 40 years of wilderness wandering, that's when they end up taking Jericho. So when they take Jericho, it's 1406 BC. Okay, that's that's the date we mark for the entrance into the land of Canaan. And when we think about the entrance into the land of Canaan, 1406 BC, that obviously happens. Uh, when Rahab is there, she interacts with the spies. So we are very clearly marking 1406 as the entrance to the land of Canaan, Rahab's existence. Now, some people have said, well, what that means is that perhaps Salmon was, or Salmon, if you're doing Hebrew pronunciation, perhaps he was one of the spies and he fell in love with Rahab and whatever. I mean, people have said all sorts of things. There's really no way to verify any of that. In fact, it's it's entirely possible that Salmon didn't even know Rahab, at least personally, because if you think about the other things that are mentioned in the book of Ruth, it's entirely possible that the book of Ruth is happening 200 plus years after that, 200 years after 1406 or so. And here's how we, we can kind of think about that with regard to with regard to the dating of what's going on. So. I think we can assume that David is begotten by Jesse. Jesse is 100% described as the father in, in the book of Samuel. So we have that as a firm date. And then I think it's reasonable to, to surmise that Obed is also the father of Jesse because that seems to be linked in pretty much every genealogy that we have. We do have uh, like genealogies in Chronicles. We have Ruth. We have Matthew. I think that these these genealogies all kind of testify to to this pre David genealogy. Now, I will say, um, just to to herald something here uh, ahead of time, is that it is possible that there are gaps in that genealogy, but I think it's very unlikely since you have multiple genealogies which say the same thing. Now, somebody might argue it's from a common source, so be it. It's it's always possible, but if we understand that this is a firm dating then we basically can trace 90 years from David through Jesse through Obed. We can add a couple of years to be safe. But if we if if Boaz and Ruth are descended, nine, if, if they are direct descendants of David through that genealogy at the very end of Ruth, which is reasonable to suppose. And if it is, then you have basically 200, maybe even 300 years from the early time of David's genealogy given in Ruth and Rahab. So if you add 40 years for David, because he was 40 years old when he became a king, and you have 25 years old for Jesse when he has David, which is just a random number to throw in there, which is reasonable, and 25 years for Obed when he has Jesse, that's 90 years. Now we know that David becomes king around 1010 BC, around 1010 to make it a round number, maybe 1011, but 1010 BC uh, essentially is when David becomes king. And so when we're calculating that and we say, okay, if if David becomes king in 1010 BC and then we add those 90 years, that brings us to about 1100 BC. You tracking with me? This is math, okay? I know that you thought this was a podcast and video about, about theology, culture, you know, understanding the Bible, but we got to do math here. So we understand that 1100 BC then doesn't get us to 1406 BC, right? There, there's a problem there. And so even if we add a bunch of years, like let's say Rahab has an incredibly long and fruitful life and she's having kids into her hundreds, which is not possible, but let's say she is. And let's say also we add some more years, 50 or 100 years to the back end of the genealogy for David. Well, still, you're not going to be able to wind up with Boaz and Rahab overlapping. So it's one of those things where it's very difficult because there are reasonably, you know, 250 years that separate them. But even if we if, even if we fudge the numbers, it's it's 150 to 200 years that separate uh, Boaz and Rahab. And. Now, granted, it might be less on either end if you substitute some names at the beginning of the Rahab genealogy and some names at the end of the genealogy. 
but there's just not a easy way to make to make Rahab the mother of Boaz. There's not. Uh, it's it's entirely possible that she is his grandmother or his great grandmother. Uh, absolutely, but it's unlikely that she is the mother of Boaz. Although the Matthew genealogy seems to describe it that way. Now that brings brings us to two other questions on this, right? Because the one question might be, well, is it possible that Matthew is talking about a different Rahab? Maybe uh, it's some, some other Rahab that we don't know. And I would say it's unlikely for a variety of reasons. Uh, probably the primary reason would be that Matthew's genealogy itself seems to be isolating and emphasizing famous women in the genealogy. And I think that that's, that's really crucial because part of Matthew's genealogy, which is kind of strange, is that he emphasizes women, which isn't normal in genealogies. And there seems to be a, a undergirding foundation in Matthew's genealogy where he's, he's celebrating the involvement of, of women in the Messianic line. And not just any women, but think about uh, we have foreigners we have prostitutes in Tamar. You know, you have you have not the not the choicest of women in any stretch of the imagination, but they are famous biblically speaking because of God's grace in in using them and and electing them, selecting them, especially in the case of Rahab and Ruth, uh, grafting them into Israel. So we have an understanding that these women are being chosen because of their significance. And it's unlikely that that a different Rahab who doesn't have any biblical significance would be chosen alongside these three other women. You have Tamar, you have Rahab, you have Ruth, and you have the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba. And so it's it's unlikely that those out of those four women, one is going to have no biblical testimony when the other three tend to have a very significant biblical testimony. So even though I guess it's hypothetically possible that it's a different Rahab, it just doesn't make as much sense uh, given the big picture, biblically speaking, and how Matthew's genealogy seems to be functioning with regard to women. So I don't think it's referring to a different woman by the name of Rahab. I think that this prominence means that we are speaking of the Rahab that comes from the city of Jericho and finds herself a part of Israel, and then God uses her and allows her to be a part of the messianic line. But here's here's the second part of this question then is is it mandatory or necessary that genealogies would list exhaustively the the descendants in order with no gaps. And the reality is that biblical genealogies function differently than the way we tend to think of genealogies. In fact, I have taken a little bit of an interest in my own family history. Uh, I guess as I get older, I tend to value history more. I guess that's just the way it works. And so I'm in regular discussions with my mother about some of our family history and what she has found out about some of our ancestors and, and who we're related to, what they've done, et cetera. And so it's nice to be able to trace generation to generation without any gaps. However, the biblical genealogies don't function that way. The biblical genealogies target people of significance and they will often skip over generations in order to avoid taking up precious space. And that's that's very typical of genealogies. In fact, maybe one of the best examples of that is in Exodus 6, because this this happens regularly. And I think Exodus 6 is probably the clearest example of this. In Exodus 6, we have the genealogy of Moses and Aaron. They're sons of Levi. They are, they are descendants of Levi. They, they are grafted and chosen by God to be the priest. And uh, Aaron becomes the high priest. His sons follow in his footsteps, etc. Now, as part of God's choosing of Levi to take care of the people with regard to priestly function, you have you know, the, the three main sons, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. Those three sons, uh, the Levitical duties are divided up among those descendants. And so in verse 16 of Exodus 6, we're told these are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations. Gershon, Kohath, Merari, the years of the life of Levi being 137 years. So we have Levi giving birth to Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. 
And then we're told that the sons of Gershon are so on and so forth. Uh, and then we get to Kohath. So in verse 18 of chapter 6, we're told the sons of Kohath are Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. So four sons there, Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. So we got those four sons being given. And then it says the years of the life of Kohath are 133 years. And then it says the sons of Merari are Mali and Mushi. And then it says in verse 20, Amram took as his wife, Jochebed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the years of the life of Amram were 137 years. So you're, you're given in Exodus 6 a very crucial piece of information. You can trace, at least according to Exodus 6, the genealogy from Levi to Kohath. And then you have Kohath to Amram and Amron to Moses and Aaron. That's four generations, right? Now, let's, let's think about this. The, you, you basically have Levi um, being a full-grown adult uh, as they enter into the land of Egypt. Uh, when Jacob brings them there, that's, that's 1876. Okay, so 1876, uh, we know that at the time of the Exodus, Moses himself was 80 years old. So that's 1446. So, and that, that's the date that Israel goes out in the Exodus. So over those 430 years, if we add up a very generous amount of time, so let's just assume 80 years old for each individual when they have their other sons, um, just to give maximum amount of time, right? So, so Levi uh, to Kohath, uh, even, so we, we give 80 years. So let's give Kohath 80 years. Let's give uh, his son, Amram, 80 years, and then we'll give Moses 80 years, right? So that's very, very generous. So three by eight, that's 240 years, right? So 240 years is not 430 years, right? So you need something to, to increase the generations to 430 years, but you can't uh, because there aren't enough names, there aren't enough uh, there aren't enough people listed in Exodus 6. So the reality is in biblical genealogies, and this is a very clear example, is that names are dropped out for sake of conciseness. And you might say, well, wait a second. It says that so-and-so fathered so-and-so father, and, and it doesn't look like there's a gap. Well, that's partly our predisposition for how we would do things because the language that, that Hebrew uses in genealogies and with regard to family is more flexible than our language that we tend to use in the way we talk about. For example, if I call somebody my father, uh, I pretty much in no other scenario would would use that word except for my my dad, my biological father who, who fathered me, raised me, etc. Uh, there, somebody may use that term if they are adopted. Uh, and there's a distinction between one's biological father and adopted father. I think that, that that is certainly plausible, but we don't have that much flexibility for terms. However, in Hebrew, you'll often see the, the word av for father being used in multiple scenarios. You, you'll see it being used of, uh, for example, another prophet where he's referring to Elijah as his father or, or Elisha. And, and so you have a terminologies being used that, that are slightly different. And the word father can, can refer to uh, grandfather, not just father, or son can refer to grandson, not just son. And the idea of so-and-so begot somebody else doesn't necessarily mean that they were the direct father. They could have been the grandfather or the great-grandfather. And so there is flexibility in the genealogies about this family language. And it's, it's not saying that that Moses is not related to Kohath. Of course, he's related to Kohath. That's the whole point of the genealogy. Kohath was given, the son, the son of Levi, Kohath, was given, and his descendants were given the privilege of being the caretakers, the priests within the tabernacle. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, even Samuel was able to function in the tabernacle under Eli at the first part of the first Samuel. Because it's it's likely, I say it's almost 
100% sure, I, but we'll say likely that Samuel was from a Levitical family that was, that was in the hill country of Ephraim. And they dedicated Samuel to, to the tabernacle. And so he was able to serve full time because he was a Kohathite. Now, so that, that's a special privilege of the family. And so we need to know that Moses and Aaron are related to Kohath because of what God has given to the privilege of Kohath. And so we, we understand that as an essential part of the genealogy. And then we're told Amram, who is uh, the father of Aaron and Moses, that that's also important to know. And but there's other names that are missing. Right. And so that, that's not a problem. That's just how biblical genealogies function. And as we as we trace that, we we understand, OK, it, the goal is not to give us every single name, but to give us the highlights and to tell us what the important the important connections are in the genealogies. And so I think that that's that's really important to process and to say, OK, it is possible that there are gaps in genealogies. Now, I want to do a timeout and a side note here just really quickly because it's on my mind. And I used to think that there were gaps in the Genesis genealogies as well. But as I've been studying that more and more, the difference between the rest of the genealogies in the Old Testament and the genealogies of Genesis, specifically I'm talking about Genesis 5, Genesis 11, is you actually have years that that are given there for so-and-so begot so-and-so after this many years and then lived this many years, et cetera. And so even if there are gaps in those genealogies with regard to people, which I'm open to that, uh, the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11 don't give allowance for extra years to be added in because of the exactness of their chronology. And I really think uh, Andrew Steinman, I think is his name, he wrote a couple articles on that with regard to tracing the Genesis genealogies and and using the formulas of years after so-and-so, after how many years so-and-so beget so-and-so, and, and using that pattern, he illustrates that even if there are people missing in the genealogies, it, you can't really accumulate extra years in there. And so, again, I think that that's evidence for a young earth, which is the reason I bring it up. But I don't know if that's on anyone else's mind, but that becomes on my mind as I'm talking about the gaps in the genealogies. It's entirely possible that somebody says, well, what about gaps in the Genesis genealogies? And I think that it's possible maybe some names are missing in the Genesis genealogies, but I don't think you can have gaps of years in the Genesis genealogies. So I do think that that is evidence for a young earth with regard to those details. All right. So now the big question is, well, OK, we, we understand that there are gaps in certain genealogies. Absolutely. Um, that's that's OK. That's that's not some some uh, assault on the dignity of the Bible. That's just how the Bible does things. There's there's no rule that says you need to list every single name of every single genealogy. But does Matthew skip names in his genealogy? Um, is that what's what's going on? And I would say he does. And there's probably multiple evidences of this, maybe two, and I'll just throw throw out uh, evidence of that. So we're told in verse three, you have Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And Pe Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Aminadab. So you, you trace from Perez to Aminadab. Uh, that is, again, the, gener the generations that were in Egypt. Uh, we're actually told in Genesis 46, you can go there and, and check me because I won't uh, give you the chapter and verse. Well, I gave you the chapter. So there you have it. But I won't give you the verse because I can't remember it. But in Genesis 46, uh, it talks about how in the 70 persons that go down with Jacob to enter the land of Egypt, you have Perez, obviously, and Hezron was already born when they entered into Egypt. All right. So Hezron is already uh, a son of Perez when he enters into the land of Egypt. And so they're there for 430 years. And as they're there, uh, Hezron becomes the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Minadab, and then they exit. Uh, you know, that's, that's essentially 400 years, four generations for 400 years is unlikely. Uh, it, that, that's again, a place where you're, Usually, scholars differ uh, with regard to how many years constitutes a generation, but you, 
usually you're going to start having children in your 20s or your 30s, right? You know, you're not going to wait till you're in your 90s. You're not going to pull an Abraham and have uh, children when you're 90 and 100 years old. You know, that's that just doesn't make sense. That's not how it normally works. That's why the example of Abraham is what we call a miracle. So I do think that that is an example where there are some generations that have dropped out in verses three and four of Matthew's genealogy. But again, it's it's hard to be dogmatic on that. It just that we, there's no other evidence elsewhere in Scripture. It just makes sense that that's where we would have some generations dropping out. But I would say that there's 100 uh, percent an example of generations dropping out in verses eight and nine. So in verses eight and nine of Matthew's genealogy, we're told that Asaph was the father of Jehoshaphat and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, Joram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, father of Hezekiah. So you say, okay, well, what's what's missing there? Well, the reality is that there's names missing between Joram and Uzziah. And you basically have. Uh, Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah missing in between there. Uh, you read through Kings, you can find those Kings there. Those are the people that are missing. And that's 100% true, very easy to, to see. So Matthew does have a propensity to drop out names. Now you might say, well, why is Matthew dropping out those names? Why, why would he drop out those names? It doesn't make sense to me as a Western reader. I want, it, I want all the details. Well, remember, he's not a Western author. Uh, he's doing things the way that he wants to. In fact, there's an interesting theory about this, and you'll have to ask our, our New Testament expert, Doug Bookman uh, at Shepherds, uh, whether or not this is a valid use of it. I, I'm not convinced. I think it's interesting, but, but it, as you study the genealogy of Matthew, it's true that there are three groups of 14. So three groups of 14 make up Matthew's genealogy in Matthew 1. And it's possible, I, I'm open to being convinced on this, but it's possible that the reason Matthew is constructing the genealogy that way is because 14 is the numerical value of David or David in, in Hebrew. And, and what this is called is basically gematria. Gematria is you know a Jewish way of interpreting scripture where you take a numerical value for the letters and you apply them. So, for example, uh, you know, in English, A would be uh, the value of one, B would be the value of two, C would be the value of three, et cetera, right? So you can add up those values. So the uh, so if you wanted to do ABC, if ABC, what would be the numerical value of that? That would be one, two, three. So the numerical value added together would be six, one plus two plus three, right? That'd be an example of how that might work, right? So gematria is, is basically that. Well, if you add the numerical values together for the name David, David, Dalit, uh, Vav, Dalit, you basically have 14. 14 is the numerical value for David. So, and then three, the threefold repetition of 14 would be a emphasis on David, 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 you know, basically emphasizing that Jesus is related to David, David, David. And it's possible. I mean, I'm not going to deny it. It's definitely a attractive possibility. The only problem is that Matthew's not here to interview saying like, is that really why you dropped out these names so that you could have three groups of 14 and that that would communicate uh, an emphasis on David? I mean, it's, it's of course it's possible and it's it's attractive just because of its esoteric nature. This may be uh, one of the only areas in scripture where, where I think that, that it's it's possible or likely that there is that that message embedded in scripture. But I tend to shy away from those those kinds of meanings because I think that scripture is generally written to be understood at, in its fullness. And so. That is possible uh, as an explanation for why some of the names are dropped out in Matthew's genealogy to try to communicate uh, that aspect and have a neatness. It is also possible that if I was writing a book and I wanted some, some systematization there or some order, I might just say, okay, well, I have 10 here. I'm also going to do 10 here. You know, that, that may be what, how Matthew decided. You know, there, there's no, no, uh, no way to be sure on that. So I think 
genealogies do tend to have gaps. I think we can we can understand that. So genealogies tend to have gaps. We also understand that Matthew's genealogy certainly has gaps, uh, just based on the examination of that. That's okay because it's it's not meant to be an exhaustive record. It's meant to hit the hit the high points and show us who Jesus is related to. And then we we have three groups of 14 given there. So at the end of the day, what's the answer to the question? Is Boaz the son of Rahab? You know, as as I Googled that question, I, I found pretty much everybody said yes. But the reality is that it's a little more complex than that. And it's unlikely that Boaz is the son of Rahab. It's possible, I think even more likely, that Boaz happens, the story of Boaz happens somewhere between 1100 BC and 1200 BC. But it is possible that Boaz happens earlier in the period of the judges and that there are names added to David's genealogy later or names dropped out. That's also a possible understanding. Or it's also possible that names have been inserted into both areas uh, before, uh, in between Rahab and Boaz and in between Boaz and David. I just think if we're thinking about likelihood, it's more likely that that names have been dropped out for sake of conciseness between Rahab and Boaz rather than between Boaz and David because of the narrative mentioning Jesse and Obed and then just because of the book of Ruth linking very closely Boaz to David. It's possibly more likely that those names are not having anybody drop out. But can we be dogmatic about that? No. The big picture is that the genealogy is tracing ultimately from Genesis, the genealogies in Genesis to the person of David. And then through David, we are receiving the tracing of that genealogy to ultimately the Messiah. So when we think about genealogies, sometimes they're boring to us, but I think that there's some lessons that we can learn from them and hopefully they're helpful to us. Well, I hope this episode's been been fun and interesting for you. I was able to record it right before I headed to Israel. So Lord willing, you are listening to this or watching this uh, while I'm in Israel. And I hope to be returning safe. If not, I suppose it's been nice knowing you all. But as always, love to hear from you. If you find it helpful, love for you to reach out and say so. Uh, feel free to drop me a note at my website, petergaiman.com. You can reach out to me there on the contact form and let me know uh, what's been helpful or, or just what the Lord's doing in your life. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.